Okay, so uh, Sally said I'm going to talk about uh, Medicare costs of Medicare to beneficiaries, which a, a lot is reviewing uh, what you've already heard today about premiums and cost sharing. Put that in a little bit of context by giving you some information on income of Medicare beneficiaries. Talk about the role of supplemental coverage and, and concerns and policy issues that have been raised about the, uh, about the impact of supplemental coverage on underlying Medicare program spending and then the policy options that have been in, uh, in debate. So just to review, oh, okay, okay, is that better? Okay. Um, so to review, so for Medicare Part A, this is the part of the, the benefit people get from having paid in payroll taxes over the years. There is no premium. Um, Ex unless people haven't paid in enough quarters over their working years, and then the premium can be as high as $407 a month, but very few people pay any premium for Medicare Part A. For Part B, the standard premium is about $105 a month in 2015. And as you heard earlier, and we'll look again, there's an income-related premium that may also apply for higher-income beneficiaries. Uh, when people choose to enroll in Part D for a prescription drug benefit, they will also pay a premium to those plans for that uh, coverage. And again, there's an income-related uh, portion that, that may apply that we'll look at. And if people choose to get their benefits for A and B and maybe A, B, and D through a Medicare Advantage plan, uh, they may or may not pay a premium. Again, that's going to vary by uh, which plan they choose. <clears throat> so for this income-related premium, the basic idea here is that the, the standard premium, the what is now $105 a month, is set by the actuaries to cover, in the aggregate, 25% of the cost of the Part B program. So the government subsidizes 75%, premiums cover 25%. The idea of adding an income-related premium is that for higher income beneficiaries, that government subsidy will be lower, and the premiums will cover a larger portion of the program costs. So for example, for the, the, the first category, for people who make between eighty-five dollars and $107,000, the premium is for this year is about $147, and that's set to cover 35% of the cost of the program and so on until the premium, so, uh, the federal subsidy gets reduced to 20% and the premiums are covering 80% of the program. Um, oops. Okay. And it's a similar, uh, similar kind of subsidy reduction for the Part D income related premium as well. So for cost sharing, and, and again, you, you saw this earlier, and I do recommend if, if you're new to all of this, looking at the Medicare and You handbook that goes out to beneficiaries. It is, it's large type, so for some of us, it's, you don't even need your reading glasses to look at it. And it's also, it's written in plain English, and so it's still a really complicated program, but it's, uh, it's a really good effort to explain it as simply as possible. Um, so there is this inpatient hospital deductible of $1,260 that applies, and again, if people have longer stays, they will have co-payments per day for, uh, for those longer uh, stays. There's, uh, for the skilled nursing facility, the post-acute, post-hospital skilled nursing benefit that Medicare covers. There's no cost sharing for the first 20 days, and then it's $157.50. There's no cost sharing generally for home health visits, although if somebody gets durable medical equipment as part of their home health services, there would be cost sharing for that. And uh, for the most part, no cost sharing for the hospice benefit. Um, and for Part B, as you heard, there's an annual deductible that's now $147 uh, for this year. For most Part B services, beneficiaries pay 20% of the cost. It's not true for home health services or lab services or for uh, some of the preventive benefits either. So that's, that's sort of the picture uh, for Parts A and B. And again, when people choose to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan for their A and B benefits or a Part D plan for their benefits, 
the cost sharing is going to be determined by the plan and will vary. There is an out-of-pocket limit that's required of, managed, uh, of the Medicare Advantage plan, so somebody who enrolls in one of those plans will have a benefit that is not a standard Medicare benefit for people enrolled in Parts A and B, and they will have an out-of-pocket limit. It cannot be more than $6,700. It varies by plan. And again, there's a separate out-of-pocket limit, sort of. It's not as hard a limit for a Part D. Um, and just look, just to give you a feel for the numbers, uh, if we look at the, the MA plans that are offered for 2015, um, the average out-of-pocket limit is about $5,000. 9% of the plans have limits of $3,400 or less, and half of plans have limits that are actually above $5,000. Um, so what does this mean in terms of uh, the dollar impact on beneficiaries? And you've seen from both the earlier speakers talked about the fact that health care costs are distributed unevenly, so we have relatively small, in any population, relatively small group of people who have much higher costs, and this plays out for the out-of-pocket costs as well. So uh, we've got almost half of beneficiaries who have out-of-pocket liabilities of less than $500, another third or so that go between $500 and $2,000, 16% between $2,000 and $5,000, and then 4% uh, you know, that are between five dollars and $10,000, and then 2% who actually have, just in their Medicare cost sharing, an out-of-pocket liability that exceeds $10,000. Um, and again, because I mean, the standard program, there is no out-of-pocket limit. That's, that's money that they're liable for. So uh, just to talk, give a little bit of, of background on, on beneficiary income. So we don't, the census, which looks at, at income and, and a lot of other uh, population characteristics, doesn't report information separately for the Medicare population, but they do report by age of household, so we can look at the elderly uh, population, which is the majority, but not all, of the Medicare population. And we can see that median household income, which is about $52,000 generally in the U.S., is about $36,000 for households uh, age 65 and older. About a little over a third of the population have incomes that are less than 200 percent of the federal poverty level. And this is a little hard to look at, but you can study this. What this chart shows us is it takes the incomes of people over age 65 and distributes them by quintiles. So each bar represents 20 percent of the population and based on their income. So on the left are the lowest income group, on the right is the highest income group, and it looks at what sources of income are. And so I've circled for you the, the, the main point here is that for the vast majority of the population over age 65, their main source of income are their monthly Social Security checks. You can see at the higher end where people are still working, they're getting earnings, but once people are out of the workforce, it's their Social Security benefit that's their main source of income. Um, uh, I've shown you this on the Kaiser Family Foundation website. They have a little interactive feature where they have done some modeling. And this is Medicare population, so it includes not just the elderly, but also the disabled population. And it allows you to look at um, characteristics uh, such as I've shown you here looking at the distribution of income by age. And here they're looking not at household income but at per capita income, which averaged, averaged for uh, 2013 about $23,600. And you could look at marital status and health status and other factors like that if you're interested. Um, so this chart which is also comes from the Kaiser Family Foundation, sort of puts everything together, and it looks at the median out-of-pocket health care spending as a share of income for Medicare beneficiaries by certain population characteristics. Uh, now, this is out-of-pocket health care spending in total. It's not just the cost-sharing amounts that we talked about earlier. So this includes 
premiums that they pay for Medicare or for supplemental coverage. It includes expenditures they make for health care services that Medicare does not cover. Um, so what this shows us is that 15.3% uh, of income is the median, so half of beneficiaries pay more than 15.3% of their income on health expend expenses and half pay less. If we look at by the, uh, various pop, uh, demographic characteristics, we can see that it's just much higher for older beneficiaries, for beneficiaries in poorer health, and when we look at, at income, we'll see that for the lowest income group, they, they spend a higher proportion of their, of their income on, on health care expenses as well. Um, and this chart <clears throat> breaks out where those expenses go. So 42% or so are used to pay health care premiums and the rest for services. And if we break out services, we've circled here a long-term care facility. Of course, this is something that Medicare does not cover. So these are services that Medicare beneficiaries have to, have to pay for uh, some other way. <clears throat> so supplemental coverage. So, and I think uh, actually th this was uh, discussed a little bit earlier too. Um, if we look at other kinds of insurance that Medicare beneficiaries have in addition to their Medicare coverage, we see that we've got uh, about, this was in 2010, 24% of the beneficiaries were enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan, which does provide this out-of-pocket limit and a different cost-sharing structure. Uh, than basic Medicare, and as was noted earlier, this is just in the last five years. This this percentage has increased significantly. It's up to, it's up to 30 percent now. Uh, we've got the 14 percent that are the dual eligible, so they have uh, Medicaid assistance in addition to their Medicare coverage. There are uh, at least in 2010, there were about 29 percent of people who had coverage uh, from an employer. We know that this number is going to decline over time because it's much less common now for someone to retire with health benefits from their former employer than it, than it used to be. Um, and then there's 22 percent or so that have Medigap coverage, the Medicare supplemental coverage, which I'll be talking more about in a minute. And then there are 10 percent of beneficiaries that have no supplemental coverage. And so these are the people who could if they got sick and had high health care expenses, could be exposed to, to a great deal of out-of-pocket uh, costs. Mm. So what is Medigap? So Medigap is optional private health insurance coverage that, pe that people, they generally purchase as individuals, or sometimes it's purchased as group coverage, that's designed to cover the Medicare cost sharing, to supplement Medi Medicare by covering cost sharing amounts. There are federal re regulations or, and a statute around uh, that regulate Medigap coverage. The law requires that the plans have to meet standards set by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, and the uh, NEIC has established a model state law which states have adopted to regulate Medigap plans. Part of this is there is a standardized set of, of, of benefit packages. There are 10 benefit packages that beneficiaries can choose among. And then there are a number of other standards, and that includes a guarantee issue period of six months that occurs when someone first turns age 65 and becomes eligible for Medicare. It means they can't be turned down for coverage by a Medigap insurer. Um, there are other circumstances that would um, uh, allow for a guaranteed issue period as well. So if somebody, for example, if somebody doesn't take Part B because they are still working and they have employer coverage, when they do ultimately give up that employer coverage, that triggers a special enrollment period as well for, for Medigap. But otherwise, if people don't choose to enroll in Medigap when they first are eligible in this six-month period and they decide later that they want to purchase it, there's no guarantee that they will be they will be uh, able to buy coverage. There's also uh, federal requirements regarding the medical loss ratio 
for uh, Medigap insurers, which is 65% for individual coverage, 75% for group coverage. There has been talk about whether those might be looked at again because under the Affordable Care Act, the medical loss ratio is higher for generally for insurers. Um, so these, uh, this is a, a chart that shows the 10 available standard benefit options for uh, Medicare beneficiaries and what they cover. So do they cover the Part A coinsurance for Part A, Part B, the um, SNF coinsurance, the deductibles. And you will see, we've circled here, uh, plans C and F are the by far the most popular choices that beneficiaries have made. Plan F has over half of all of the Medigap enrollees, and there are another 13% in Plan C. You'll also notice if you scan down to the line that shows the Part B deductible, these are two plans that cover the Part, the part B deductibles and a number of the other options do not um, cover that. Uh, this is what Medigap premiums looked like <coughs> in 2010. So for the, for the different plan types, so if we look at Plan F, the most popular plan, um, the national average premium, and again, this varies across the country, uh, varies by insurer, even within a, a particular area. Uh, but for Plan F, the national average premium, monthly premium was $181. Uh, and you can see the distribution. So there were 10% of plans that were below 155 and 10% of plans that were higher than $197 for that, for that option. So the policy issue that has arisen around uh, Medigap coverage has to do with, with and, and this has already been talked about this morning, when, when people don't have any cost-sharing obligation, this is going to affect their, uh, their behavior in terms of their uh, willingness or desire to go seek medical services. They're going to use more services, which drives up the cost of the underlying uh, Medicare program. That's the concern, is that there's going to be overuse of services by people who have Medigap, particularly first dollar coverage, which as we've seen is, is a majority of the choices that people have made. Uh, but we, what we don't know, and, and, we, and I'll show you some numbers in a minute, so we do know it is true that people who have Medigap have higher Medicare expenditures than people who don't. What we don't know is how much of it is because they have Medigap and so they're just more willing to go to the, see the physician or receive medical services. And how much of it is that people who know they have health issues and are going to need them are going to choose to purchase Medigap coverage? It could be that the 10% of people are people like the woman we heard about and who's down in Florida kayaking and doesn't really ever go see the doctor. She might decide, I'm not going to want to spend money on Medigap because I'm never going to use it. So we don't know how, how all of that sorts out. MedPAC uh, a couple years ago developed some recommendations that we'll talk about in this, and as part of their work, they did a review of the literature that looked at the uh, effects of cost sharing, and we know that, uh, that when people face cost sharing, it means that they will use few, fewer services. In some cases, that means they'll forego needed medical care as well as, as, as medical care that maybe is, would be considered overuse. We know that lower income individuals are more uh, sensitive to cost sharing as well. So, um, so this, this is a chart I referenced, and I'm sorry, it looks like the, there's a long note in their chart at the bottom, and I'll, I'll fix this for whatever gets posted on the website. This comes from the MedPAC uh, data book from June 2014, and it's a chart that shows um, total Medicare or total spending um, for uh, beneficiaries based on their source of supplemental coverage. So as you can see, I've circled on the right, people, this 10 percent, these are the people who have no supplemental coverage. Their total medical expenditures are about $9,300 for people with Medigap it's closer to $16,000. So that's the differential that people are concerned about and that's been the source of discussion. Uh, there was a provision in the ACA that uh, directed um, 
the secretary, because this, you know, it's all very tricky with, with the, these roles with the uh, insurance commissioners because the federal government doesn't regulate them, but it asked the sec directed the secretary to please ask them to, to uh, look at this, these two plans, CNF, the two popular plans, the ones that provide first dollar coverage, and to look at uh, perhaps modifying them to include some nominal cost sharing um, and they wanted them to look at the peer-reviewed literature and experience with integrated health plans and come up with some sort of a cost-sharing uh, proposal. And they did respond to this, uh, but they didn't, but they recommended that there not be changes to the plans. They said they looked at the literature and they didn't find anything that was um, directly relevant to the question they were being asked. Uh, they were concerned about discouraging the use of needed medical care, again, which is the other part of this argument. And they also pointed out there are some newer plans, and if you, uh, M and N on the list, that do pro would provide for some uh, co-payments for physician services. And so they thought since these plans are available, um, that would, would cover the, the concern. So that, that sort of stopped there um, with respect to the ACA provision. So in terms of other policy options that have been looked at, there's really sort of two buckets. I've listed a number of them here, but there's two buckets. There's one set of options that would go into the federal law that regulates Medigap and change what these benefit packages can look like to eliminate first dollar coverage. So. For example, uh, and, and the Simpson-Bowles Commission, the Deficit Reduction Commission back in 2010 recommended a version of this that CBO has taken and, and scored in their recent budget options book a, a variation on this idea. And the I idea is that you basically say Medicare plans can't uh, provide any coverage, say, for, in this example, for the first $650 and then they can't cover more than 50% of the cost sharing uh, for the next amount here. Effectively, it produces, if, if people with Medigap would have an out-of-pocket maximum of $3,575, but they would be liable for cost sharing up to that. There wouldn't be first dollar coverage anymore. Um, they scored this in this recent budget option book as saving, 10-year um, savings of $53 billion. If you just did that piece, and then they looked at if you did that in combination with restructuring the underlying Medicare benefit to be less like a 50-year-old benefit and more like something we might see today where there would be a, a single deductible cost sharing and an out-of-pocket cap. Um, so that's one set of options, and there was a, a legislation in the last Congress, Senators Corker and Alexander introduced that kind of went along those lines of changing the Medig what could be offered for Medigap. And they actually went so far as to then phase out Medigap entirely after a certain point. They would allow people who have had Medigap coverage to continue it in this modified form, but, but newer beneficiaries wouldn't, wouldn't have that option available. Um, so that's sort of the one set. The other uh, approach, and it's something that was in the President's budget uh, this that came out earlier, uh, I guess it was earlier this last week. Uh, this week, last week, I've lost track of time. Um, it, it was also proposed in previous budgets. And that, and that's something that MedPAC has recommended as well. And that concept is you don't, don't change the Medigap plan structure. Let those, if there's first dollar coverage and that's what people want, let them go ahead and, and have first dollar coverage. But recognizing that that has an impact on total program spending, make them pay something more to the Medicare program to offset that cost. And so um, in the President's proposal, there would be a surcharge that would be roughly equivalent to an additional 30 percent on the standard Part B premium. Um, and this would be only for new enrollees who choose to purchase Medigap coverage. Uh, and they say with particularly low cost sharing, which we can probably guess would be plan C enough, but they don't really specify that. Um, and they score that OMB as having a $4 billion reduction in federal spending. 
so, and, and MedPAC recommended something similar, some sort of a, a surcharge on supplemental insurance. They also would do this in the context of restructuring all the, the Medicare benefit underneath, having a single deductible and uh, different kind of a cost-sharing structure. And they are interested in looking at um, giving the secretary authority to link cost-sharing to um, the value of the service, so giving, giving kind of a, which is what some private insurers are experimenting with uh, now. So, um, so some of the policy issues as these, as these uh, options get discussed uh, are looking at, so are we talking just about doing something with Medigap, or are we looking at Medigap changes in the context of a broader restructuring of Medicare cost sharing, like adding an out-of-pocket cap? Um, because I will say, as has been discussed earlier, the fact that Medicare doesn't have that is it makes it, uh, you know, for people who are who are looking at whether they need to buy Medigap insurance, the fact that you, if you don't have any sort of supplemental insurance, you have really unlimited exposure if you get really sick is a is a big issue. Um, would the change, would whatever changes are being talked about apply across the board to the whole Medicare population? Or would it only be to new beneficiaries that along the lines of what's in the president's budget? And obviously the, the budgetary effects are very different uh, with that. Uh, what happens to retiree health plans? So we've been talking about people who elect to purchase private um, Medigap coverage uh, with these 10 standard plans and so on. People who have retiree coverage arguably have, have uh, similar issues if they've got first dollar coverage, which not all of them do, uh, but, but the, that would be something that would uh, need to be looked at. And then, you know, so if changes are made, uh, what, what is it going to mean? I'm, obviously, the, the market has spoken. People are choosing these plans that have no cost-sharing liability at point of service. So they're basically, if you're buying a Medigap plan that covers the Part B deductible, you're paying that $147. You're paying it to the Medigap plan. Uh, right. But what you get in return is then you know I write the same check every month. I'm writing, you know, paying the same premium every month. I know what it's going to be. And that way if I go to the doctor, I don't have to worry about coming up with whatever the cost sharing is at the point of service. People clearly really value this. And so that option isn't available anymore. You know, what will that mean? And we don't know. I mean, there could be... There could be generational issues here, too. I mean, people who retired 20 years ago were in, more of them were more likely to be in employer health plans that didn't have a kind of higher cost-sharing structure that we've all gotten used to uh, in more recent years. And so it could be, there could be differences. We don't know from the data to what extent newer Medicare beneficiaries are making different choices about uh, Medigap coverage. Um, and then there are other questions about the distributional effects on beneficiaries of any changes. Um, you, you, again, we know that people who are, uh, have more health problems, who are lower income, are going to be more sensitive to any changes that affect uh, their cost-sharing burdens. So I will take any questions.